it's lovely to see you on this dark January evening. I was um, sitting in the Whale Tail Cafe in Lancaster having lunch today and um, they played a, a song by uh, John Denver, uh, Country Roads, and it goes like this. Country roads take me home to the place I belong. West Virginia, mountain mama, take me home, country roads. All my memories gather round her. And I had a memory of meeting uh, John Denver in uh, 1980 when uh, Trudy and I were staying in an ashram in uh, Los Angeles. And he came into the uh, kitchen where I was uh, washing up and he said, hi, I'm John. And I said, hi, I'm Josh. And I shook his hand with my soapy glove. Um, he died in a plane crash in uh, 1997, 17 years uh, later. But he, um, he really uh, enjoyed his, his visit to the ashram and uh, was really uh, interested in uh, meditation. So I have a question for you this evening. Um, we're all at home, we're all at home and we're very fortunate to be at home in the warm and have food. But do you feel at home? And what does that question mean to you? What does it mean to feel at home? And the second question I have is, where do you come from? I asked my three new uh, grandsons shortly after they're born, uh, where do you come from? And in couple of years they'll say Morecambe or Lancaster, just as we sometimes say we come from a place. So there's a distinction for me about having a home and feeling at home. And I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately about belonging and home. And I've also been thinking, which is a curious word, about what I do with my mind and how at home I am inside my mind. There's a, a poem by the Scottish poet Norman McCaig called An Ordinary Day. <clears throat> And it starts, I took my mind a walk, or my mind took me a walk, whichever was the truth of it. I took my mind a walk, or my mind took me a walk, whichever was the truth of it. When um, Trudy and I went to Lewis in Sussex to lead Martin's funeral, one of the uh, thoughts I had about um, going there, apart from the, um, the significance of leading a funeral, was that um, I'm going home. I'm going back to where I came from, which I do from time to time. And where I think I come from is the area south of London, which includes Surrey, Sussex and Kent. The first 30 years of my, my life I spent in those three counties. And I have a map of my life in my heart of that area. 
So I'm going to share a little bit of the journey to Lewis and in sharing it, I'm sharing the journey of my, my mind. And it starts as soon as I get to Victoria Station. It doesn't happen at Euston because Euston faces north. But I get to Victoria Station and I just hear, like the shipping forecast, all the announcements of the stations in Surrey, Sussex and Kent. And some of the lines I just know off by heart, like knowing a, a poem. And then I hear the uh, London accents and I smell the London smells. And I'm aware that many people are just going south to sleep. And they'll come back in the morning like I used to when I was a young man working in London. Be in London during the day and you'd be somewhere else at night. And I feel a lot of love and grief and excitement and gratitude when I arrive there. And my, my loved ones are kind of there somewhere in those three counties, my loved ones up to the age of, of 30. And the railway line between London and Brighton uh, was our motorway because we didn't have a car in the 50s and 60s. So I know every station off by heart as I do quite a few of the other lines in the southeast. So after Victoria, you have Clapham Junction, East Croydon, Purley, Coulston South, Merston, Red Hill, Earlswood, Salfords, Hawley, Gatwick Airport, Three Bridges, Borkhamme, Haywards Heath, Wibblesfield, Burgess Hill, Hassocks, Preston Park, and Brighton. And I think I've got off at some point at all of those stations. And as I traveled down to Lewis with Trudy, uh, I think about different things that have happened. So at East Croydon, it's where I had my first job in 1967 in a labor exchange. And in Purley, I remember taking a girl out on a date to the Orchid Ballroom in 1968. And Red Hill, I can remember being in Red Hill, visiting a friend whose father was a tobacconist and I can smell the tobacco in that really harsh winter of 1963. And I remember having trouble getting home after that. And as I pass Hawley, where I was brought up, I went there in 1954, I have that sense of, of being created in some way by being there. And uh, that a mile away from the station is my house and it's the place my mother died. So all along the line, there is kind of history. But it's a little bit like, um, I'm looking through it through a railway carriage window and that's a metaphor really for uh, it's not quite as I remember it. It's changed, it's particularly around Hawley and Gatwick Airport, it's built up so some of the beautiful woods have been tarmacked over for runways or motorways but also there's some kind of something I'm grasping for or clinging to that just isn't there. It, it's an experience I'm kind of hoping for but doesn't actually happen. And then we went to Lewis and to the crematorium to lead Martin's funeral which was very beautiful. 
And of course, that's all about the great matter of life and death and belonging. And um, the countryside is very beautiful there, but there's some way in which I'm still looking through a carriage window, even when I'm not on the train. It's not quite as I remember it. And there's a lovely verse from uh, Basho. He says, even in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoo's cry, I long for Kyoto. So I would say, even in Sussex, seeing the leaves falling, I long for Sussex. It almost doesn't quite meet something that I'm grasping. And then after the funeral, we um, came home. <laughs> we were coming home to Lancaster. It's like, oh, we're going home now. And I was pleased to be going home. And I was aware I'm facing with my back to the engine and I'm facing Trudy and I'm seeing all of this past kind of receding. Um, and I'm wanting to be away from it because it hasn't quite met something that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of grasping for. The writer L.P. Hartley said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And when I'm home, it's actually easier to have an experience of my childhood from Lancaster. It's a very curious thing. It's like it's in my heart. It's not necessarily in the landscape. There was um, <clears throat> a teacher called Kodo Sawaki Roshi. He was called Homeless Kodo because he, he wouldn't accept um, uh, becoming an abbot at a monastery and he he didn't want to set up an organization. So he was called Homeless Kodo and he wandered from place to place um, teaching. And in March 1965, shortly before he died, in an interview with Shunpei Uyama, Suwaki Roshi said, from the time of our childhood, we're all homeless. If you think you have a home, you are mistaken. From the time of our childhood, we are all homeless. If you think you have a home, you are mistaken. And Uchiyama Roshi, who was his uh, student, another very famous teacher who died more recently, he said, as his disciple, I did not always feel good when I heard Sawaki Roshi called homeless Kodo. The word homeless reminded me of stray dogs and cats. But now I understand that his nickname is really a title for the true person. Everyone is a stray in reality. Everyone is a stray in reality. I've been thinking about what Flint was saying um, on Tuesday. And what really struck me was the the phrase sabe sankara dukkha, all formations have the characteristics of dukkha, all constructions that we create, in this case about there being something in Surrey and Sussex and Kent that I have an idea about rather than appreciating Surrey, Sussex and Kent that I might cling to have the characteristics of being unsatisfactory and lead to suffering. So the three marks of existence are anika, impermanence, everything changes, sabe sankara anika, all constructions have the nature of impermanence, which is what I was experiencing so vividly in the south. Anatta, emptiness, no independently existing self. Everything is contingent. 
all constructions have the nature of non-self. So when I'm thinking about the past, um, I'm not sure who it is who's doing the thinking. Whether there's a continuous self which can experience the memories and the reality of being there at that time. And then dukkha, unnecessary suffering if the first two are not understood. Everything is inherently unsatisfactory. And Flint says, therefore, the Buddha's teachings at their core are addressed to sankharas, mental formations and constructions, what we think. So I was thinking today, as I was preparing this talk, if we're all strays in reality, what is it to be at home? And at the time I was doing the dishes, thinking about this talk rather than doing the dishes. And I thought at that moment, being at home is doing the dishes. At another moment, it can be doing the hoovering. It can be looking after your children. I had that sense of you're always home. So I just want to conclude with the, um, the poem again by Norman McCaig. He says, I took my mind a walk, or my mind took me a walk, whichever was the truth of it. I wonder how your mind has been in the last three weeks since we met. Have you taken it a walk, or has it taken you a walk? What was the truth of it? And at the end of the poem, he says, And my mind observed to me, or I to it, how ordinary things are, like the nature of the mind in the process of observing. And my mind observed to me, or I to it, how ordinary things are, like the nature of the mind and the process of observing. So we've gone from John Denver saying, take me home to the place I belong, to the possibility of belonging in any place that we exist.